Not As Nature Intended by Rich Hardy The Prologue, 1999 I watch the silhouette of five dolphins rear up in the wave face and then go left as I stroked over the top of the breaking wave. Just as I had harnessed the previous wave's energy to race down the line using the fins of my surfboard to spray droplets of water back into their salty home, these creatures were here for the same reason, to surf the waves, pure enjoyment. And it wasn't just the dolphins. Nature was throwing a party. Seabirds were base jumping from nearby cliffs, their long beaks splitting the water's surface with minimal disruption. Fish leaped and fronds of kelp waved at me as I duck dived my board under and through the lip of every watery chandelier that broke in front of me. Surfing was my release. It still is. It provides me with an opportunity to see the best of what nature has to offer, even at a time when nature is taking a battering at the hands of humans. But that day, despite all that awe and wonder, I couldn't shake off the sight of the giant sheds on the road running down to the beach, or the telltale, foul-smelling odour above them. I hadn't expected to find a factory farm in such an idyllic spot. As a professional campaigner working on behalf of animal organisations for nearly a decade, I was very aware of what was inside those sheds. Hens, tens of thousands of them, each one genetically selected to put every ounce of energy they could muster into the production of an egg. A day. An egg so clean and so perfect, surely, it could only be laid by prize hens, living the most lavish of chicken lives. Not so. I knew that these hens were kept locked up in battery cages so small they couldn't even stretch their wings. I had taken a year off from campaigning to go to New Zealand, exploring remote sections of the East Coast and seeking out lonely waves to surf. Just a few months earlier, my colleagues and I had secured a monumental campaign victory that saw the European Union outlaw the use of barren battery cages for egg-laying hens. Ultimately, those barren cages were replaced with so-called enriched cages, which offered some basic improvements in the form of a nest box, perches and a dust bathing area. Of course, enriched cages were never going to be the answer. A cage is still a cage. But getting any factory farming system banned was a huge challenge. To end one of the worst examples of factory farming and to see the industry have to shell out huge sums of money to change their system, it cost £400 million in the UK alone, was worth celebrating. It offered hope and showed the industry that change was coming and they were going to have to pay for it. It was a victory hard won and I was exhausted. Working full time on that campaign had taken everything out of me and I needed a recharge before I could contemplate returning to more work for animals. So I dusted down my surfboard and travelled to New Zealand, the first stop in what would be a year-long surf trip. A few days later, and having parted with a good chunk of dollars to buy a beaten-up Mitsubishi van in which to live and travel, I was sitting on my board beyond the breaking waves. A lull in the waves had got me reflecting on the hens in those sheds, during the campaigning period, I had undertaken a lot of talks and given interviews in the media about why it was wrong to keep hens in battery cages. I had a convincing patter and knew all the scientific and ethical arguments, but I had never actually seen hens in cages for myself. I considered this a weakness when it came to lobbying and, on several occasions, this was underlined when I was undermined by the opposition and also by decision makers capable of creating change for hens and while the campaign had been successful there weren't vast banks of film footage available to reference so campaigners were very reliant on written evidence such as scientific reports to make their case. I couldn't help thinking that if there were more imagery available to show people and politicians what life was really like inside these dreadful factory farms it might be possible to speed up the rate of change. The next set of waves came through and I paddled hard for the first wave. The lip threw out far enough for me to sneak inside the barrel. 
and for a split second I was enveloped in the swirling watery mass. On exiting, instead of continuing down the green wall that was offering a much longer ride, I directed my board towards the beach. Even though I was on holiday, I was going to that farm above the beach and I was going to look inside. I felt this was something I could and had to do for myself. With hair still dripping wet, I parked the van in a lay-by. Without looking for a towel, I peeled off my wetsuit and grabbed my video camera from the footwell in the passenger seat before I could change my mind. I didn't really look after it very well. It was always getting a battering from the extreme weather while documenting the surf trips I was making. As I walked towards the farm, I frantically rubbed grains of sand and surf wax from its outer casing and cleaned the lens with my t-shirt. All seemed quiet. It was lunchtime, so perhaps the workers were eating in the main house. I knew that hundreds of thousands of dollars were spent on building factory farms like this to keep the hens in and the public out. Designed like a fortress, this one had no windows and really offered no clues as to what was on the inside if you were an outsider. Long, dark shadows cast from the tall buildings, which incarcerated the unfortunate hens, smothered the ground. It was a foreboding place set back from a rural road and with no close neighbours, its considered positioning would normally be enough to keep the animals out of sight and out of mind. But not today. Despite all the investment, the physical barriers and the foreboding atmosphere, it was the lack of a simple $10 padlock that enabled me to get inside. Without even considering what I would say if I were confronted, I slid back the giant door of one of the sheds. I instinctively slipped the toggle off the camera to record and its little red light lit up a pathway in the darkness for me to follow. While the light level was low, the noise was not. Though I couldn't yet see them, I could hear squawking and the flapping of wings against metal from beyond another steel door. It was unlocked. I looked back over my shoulder, still no one, so I opened the door. Like high-rise flats, the battery cages rose up all around me in every direction. I suddenly felt quite small amongst them and found my eyes straining in the poor light to judge how far back they went. It was a long way, too long to calculate from inside. Feathers were falling from the highest tiers and hens were taking it in turns to jut out their scrawny necks through gaps in the cage bars. Just as I would frequently strain to come up from air after being pile-driven beneath the surface of the sea from a particularly fearsome wave, it struck me that these birds were doing something similar. I felt like it was freedom they were reaching out for. With wide eyes and gaping beaks, they grabbed their moments away from the cage before a cage mate jostled them out of position for their turn. On and on it went down the aisle. Like a cash register springing into action, thousands of hens were trying to escape from the wire mesh prisons they were forced to endure for their 18-month life. Such a short and miserable life for a bird that could in natural settings live for 8 to 10 years. This barren system forms the foundation for how factory farming works. It is completely reliant on cages, crates or vast indoor warehouses where animals are packed in at the highest stocking densities. They restrict space and by doing so deny natural animal behaviour. It is this system that produces the bulk of the world's meat, eggs and dairy. Their overgrown claws curled around the sloping wire floors of their cages. Their bodies were a 50-50 mix of feathers and sore skin. I already knew this was not a natural molt, though feathers were pulled out by each other through a combination of stress and boredom. To mitigate the damage this caused, the farmer had made sure all his hens had arrived with beaks trimmed. A painful but legal process carried out with a red hot blade. This was an industry solution to preventing the worst injuries from the hens pecking at each other. Halfway down the aisle, I found my first corpse, rotting in a far corner of the cage. It must have been here for days. I couldn't imagine trying to check these cages each day for birds that had fallen sick or injured. It would be a huge job. I looked at my watch. 20 minutes had passed since I had entered the shed and started filming. How long would workers stop for lunch? An hour? 30 minutes perhaps? I decided it was probably time to leave. I turned and made my way back towards the big door. I found myself saying sorry. Not once, 
but a few times as I passed by each cage. I knew it wasn't enough, but it was the only thing I could do at that moment. I was upset and could feel my emotions were close to the surface. Talking to the hens somehow helped me stay composed. The door slid back easily, but it was not my hand pulling the giant handle. Instead, I was hastily bundling the camera into my jacket pocket. I came face to face with a tall, red-haired man who could just as easily have played for the All Blacks instead of rearing hens. G'day, I said. What are you doing in here? He asked. I was looking for you. I, uh, wanted to buy some eggs. The farmer looked me up and down a few times suspiciously. Well, you won't find them for sale in here. He ushered me outside and shut the door. What ensued was a little back and forth about trespassing on his properties. My eggs can't be bought on site, he said. A truck collects them and then they get distributed all over the country. Right, I said. And I don't like people I don't know coming onto my farm, he added. Sorry, I said, as a way of not escalating the situation. I had a reprimand, but it was nothing more than a slap on the wrist. Red escorted me to the main gate and then, with arms crossed, remained vigilant as I returned to my van and drove away. I felt the warmth of my camera in my pocket and I knew I had just recorded something with campaigning value. I had also surprised myself by thinking quickly on my feet and managing to capture something I'd not seen before when campaigning for Europe's hens. I had followed my instinct and the belief that to make a difference for animals, you had to tell their story. For me, that started with taking their picture and recording their life. Taking a few minutes to process what I'd just seen, it was much clearer to me why those official requests I'd made in the past to visit hen farms in the UK had been rebuffed. These really were not places, these really were not places the public would enjoy visiting and the egg industry already knew that. Sitting in the driver's seat of my van, hands still clasped firmly around my camera, I realised I could and should do more than just say sorry to those hands. After all, I had evidence of their suffering. I pulled out the crumpled map of New Zealand that was stashed in the dashboard and added an X to mark the spot. On Auckland, I would have to travel to the big city to find the nation's animal rights community. People just like me, people who wanted to make a difference to the lives of animals, to show others their suffering and lobby for change. Like me, such people felt that animals deserve much more than a factory farm. They recognised that animals are sentient, experience a range of emotions, emotions and feelings and can form relationships with fellow animals and humans too. And as it turned out, they valued the imagery I'd captured and vowed to make sure it was seen. The next day I was back in the lineup, a new surf spot and some memorable waves welcomed me back into the sea, a place I'd always felt at home. No dolphins that day, but that was understandable. I think they know they can't trust humans, nor should they given what we've done to so many of our fellow creatures. Bobbing up and down on my board, alone except for my thoughts, I began planning for a new way of working to help animals. Exploring a little used method at the time for evidence gathering, I was going to go undercover. I would combine secret filming with storytelling to campaign for change. I'd become someone who'd go to dark places to bring issues to light. I would document rather than openly advocate. I knew it would be a lonely experience, But out here, now, in the raw ocean, I was always comfortable and happy in my own company. A year later, I was back in the UK. I saved a few pennies working on New Zealand fruit farms and invested in some cameras, making sure they were small enough to stash in my pocket if needed. My experience in that battery farm in New Zealand sent me on a 20-year undercover journey to document and expose the suffering that animals endure to provide us with our food, fashion and entertainment. My first assignment was for an MPO, non-profit organisation, campaigning to stop live animal exports across Europe. I joined a small team of investigators training livestock trucks as they travelled to farms and slaughterhouses in southern Spain. Soaring summer temperatures, faulty water systems and trucks failing to rest animals properly were documented and European law to protect the welfare of live animals during transport was not just broken but shown as lacking and unenforceable. It was an emotional experience but one I would have to get used to. I knew when I started this journey that there was a long road ahead full of injustices to document and expose and that my efforts 
would be just one part of the solution. A lot has changed since I started this work, but there is still a lot left to change if we are to help animals, our planet and ourselves. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reported that a huge reduction in meat and dairy consumption is essential to avoid climate breakdown, yet globally each year we farm 70 billion animals for meat, milk or eggs. With two out of every three farm animals now factory farmed, and that's just on land, as many as 120 billion fish are thought to be intensively farmed in the world's seas and oceans. Wild animals, in their millions, continue to be caught and killed in traps for their fur each year, and more than 100 million remain incarcerated in fur farms. And of the 195 countries in the world, only 26 have bans on wild animal circuses. The following stories you will read are based on the extracts of my investigation journals. They are just a few of many, but I feel they best represent the type of issues I've documented and the challenges and adversities typically experienced when spending long periods of time working undercover. I have been careful to admit exact locations and to change people's names in order to avoid personal retaliation from the people and industries that have been the subject of these investigations. Aside from that, Aside from that, these encounters are a true representation of what life is like as an undercover investigator working on behalf of animals. Yours, with the animals, Rich. Not as nature intended, by Rich Hardy.